Hi everyone, this is lecture 21, Digestive System. So today we're going to talk about the digestive system. And as we talk about the digestive system, we're going to go one by one from the mouth all the way through the large intestine and talk about the different digestive processes location by location. So the digestive system is responsible for the processing and the uptake of ingested nutrients into the body. What does that mean? That means that the food that you eat is going to get broken down and taken into the body through the digestive tract. So the process of digestion is moving substances through the various portions of the digestive tract through motility, creating secretions that help to move and help to break down the food that we eat, and then the actual processes of breakdown, which is digestion. There's mechanical breakdown and chemical breakdown using enzymes. And then finally, once the food is broken down into its small building blocks that are tiny enough to get across the cellular um, spaces and across the cell membranes within the digestive system, then we can absorb them from the digestive tract into the blood. So first, motility. Motility is the movement of substances through the digestive tract. And because these are involuntary organs, they are um, lined with smooth muscle. So this is achieved by smooth muscle contractions, and there are different types of movements. There are propulsive movements, which push the contents forward through the digestive tract, and there are mixing movements that are churning and breakdown movements, facilitating the breakdown to help absorption occur after that breakdown happens. So we haven't talked a lot about smooth muscle contraction, but smooth muscle contraction is made easier by the fact that smooth muscle is connected by gap junctions. So we talked about gap junctions both in our cellular communication lecture and also in our cardiovascular lecture. Gap junctions are when cells are directly connected such that they share any ion changes. So if one cell gets an electrical signal to contract, that is directly transferred to the nearby cells so that groups of cells function as a unit or a syncytium. The heart muscle behaves this way as well. So there are, in the digestive system, similar to what we have in the heart, there are pacemaker cells in the digestive system. And these will generate waves of smooth muscle activity. These waves and contractions will be much slower and more rhythmic than the heart pumping and relaxation contraction waves. And these are going to occur in waves throughout the digestive system. So the presence of food and hormones can increase activity or motility, and each region of the digestive system has its own rate, which helps to um, specialize the different functions within each of the regions of the digestive system. And as we go through each region, I will tell you the specific type of motility that happens in each region. Secretion is another major function of the digestive system. Secretion is release of chemicals. So there are specialized cells within regions of the digestive system that are exocrine cells. So that means that they are going to release substances into the middle of the digestive tract. So the center of the digestive tract where the food is moving through, the hollow center of these organs, is called the lumen. And that will include fluid, electrolytes, enzymes, and mucus. One specialized region of the digestive system also secretes bile, and we'll talk about that. There can also be specialized cells within the digestive system that secrete hormones. Hormones are endocrine because they are released into the blood. 
and these can act locally or long distance on the digestive organs to help to control um, different functions such as increase or increasing or decreasing motility, increasing or decreasing other secretions, and supporting overall the functions of the digestive tract. So motility and secretion will be regulated by a specialized set of nervous cells within the digestive tract. This is called the enteric nervous system and it contains the submucosal and the myenteric plexus. So you probably haven't heard these words in a while. You have to think back to your anatomy. So if you think about the anatomy of the digestive tract, you have several layers of the digestive tract. You have the mucosa, which is right along the hollow center or the opening within the digestive tract. And then you have your submucosa, which is below that mucosa layer. And then you're going to have your muscular layers. So you have a layer of smooth muscle. And then you will have a layer of connective tissue. So the smooth muscle layers are those longitudinal and circular muscle layers, and then the connective tissue layer is either the adventitia or the serosa, depending on where you are. So you have nerves in the submucosa and within the smooth muscle called the myenteric and submucosal plexus. These are large networks of nerve fibers within the digestive system that can regulate the contraction of smooth muscle in the case of the myenteric plexus and also exocrine and endocrine secretions, mainly in the case of the submucosal plexus. There will also be hormones which can regulate motility and secretion. And there will be specialized endocrine cells which we will point out as we go through. For that, we also need receptors. So there will be various types of receptors within the digestive system to help to regulate. We will have chemoreceptors, which are sensing the level of various uh, nutrients. Um, also some chemical sensors such as acid. Um, osmoreceptors, which will sense the salt and water balance, mechanoreceptors, which will be sensitive to movement um, and, and include stretch receptors, sensitive to the contents of the digestive tract, and these can affect both the enteric nervous system within the digestive system and also um, generally hormone responses. So we can have external influences that lead to changes in the autonomic nervous system that can affect the smooth muscle contraction of the digestive system. So we learned in previous lectures about the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest nervous system, which can enhance the motility of digestion. And now we're adding on to that local changes that can happen through the intrinsic nerve plexuses or the enteric nervous system. Those can also locally regulate the digestive system, smooth muscle contraction and secretions. Both of those can send signals to the endocrine system and lead to production of hormones, which can also regulate the motility and secretion of the digestive system. So now to digestion. So digestion is the breakdown of food. And I prefer to divide it into mechanical digestion and chemical digestion. So mechanical digestion is physical mixing and churning that breaks down large masses of food into smaller masses of food. So notice I didn't say, you know, proteins to amino acids here. Mechanical digestion is really about getting big chunks of food into smaller chunks of food so that the enzymes can then break down, say, proteins into amino acids. So chemical digestion will take the smaller masses of food that mechanical has broken down into smaller surface area and then chemical digestion will take the enzymes to actually break chemical bonds of large molecules into their small molecules. So here I'm showing you guys just a reminder of the monomer, monomers or the, the small molecules which make up the large molecules. And we learned about this when we learned about macromolecules. So amino acids put together make proteins. Nucleotides put together make nucleic acids like DNA. 
monosaccharide or sugar rings put together can make starches or polysaccharides. Fatty acids put together can make lipids or fat molecules. But in the digestive system, we're actually going to go the other way. We're going to take the food which is made up of proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and fats in a mixture, depending on what you eat, and we're going to mechanically break them down into small chunks and then chemically use enzymes to break their bonds. So for example, we will have enzymes that break peptide bonds in particular, type, in particular places and we'll break proteins down into smaller peptides and even smaller building blocks, the amino acids. So the major classes of molecules that have to be broken down into smaller building blocks in order to be absorbed are these. Proteins need to be broken down into amino acids, the smallest of building blocks for proteins. Polysaccharides need to be broken down into monosaccharides, the smallest of building blocks for sugars. And lipids need to be broken down into triglycerides and fatty acids. Often this is done through hydrolysis reactions where water is used to break the bonds between two large molecules. So for example, here is maltose, which is a disaccharide, and put together with water and enzymes, it will break down into two glucose molecules. Once they are broken down into their smallest building blocks, those tiny building blocks can then be absorbed across the lumen of the digestive tract. So here is a small intestine cell with its villi and microvilli within the small intestine. So these microvilli add surface area with which to absorb these small molecules. Often this will be done with the help of co-transporters and specialized channels for these molecules, but here's an example. So we have broken down some starches into glucose or galactose, and they will then use a glucose transporter, which is a co-transporter with sodium, to bring glucose into the small intestine cell. Now this is an epithelial cell or a lining cell where it is right up against the lumen of the digestive tract. So the glucose will enter the epithelial cell and it will then exit the epithelial cell to enter the blood nearby. And it will then diffuse into the blood and then the blood will get those nutrients and can carry those nutrients through the rest of the body to deliver them to the body cells where they are needed. So this will include small molecules like the building blocks, amino acids, monosaccharides, fatty acids, triglycerides. This will also include water, certain vitamins, and electrolytes that are needed by the body. Some will go into the blood and some will go into the lymphatics and we'll talk about those differences. So now let's get into the digestive processes by location. So I want to remind you of the digestive organs and we are also, as we go through, we're going to one by one go through each location and talk about what is the function or set of functions in that location, what are the enzymes, if any, found in that location, and then are there any other specializations that we need to know in that location of the digestive system? So we will start with the mouth. Food enters the mouth and is swallowed down the throat through the pharynx. And then from the pharynx to the esophagus, the tube that runs from the throat down to the stomach. And then from the stomach, into the small intestine. We have three regions of the small intestine. Do you guys remember the three regions of the small intestine? Try to rack your brain. Duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And then the ileum of the small intestine enters the large intestine, which is not large because it's longer, but because it's wider. So then the large intestine goes up 
across and down, so ascending, transverse, descending colon, and then the sigmoid colon, and then to the rectum and the anus, where the food will be, the food waste will be eliminated. So by the time we get to the large intestine, just about everything should be absorbed, and then the waste will be eliminated. The digestive organs are continuous along this digestive tract. They are separated by divisions and sphincters into specialized functional regions. And if you remember from anatomy, their inner linings change based on their function. But we also have two major accessory organs that we will discuss. So this large brown organ here is the liver. The liver has many functions, but it also helps with digestion with the help of the gallbladder. And then tucked in here, you may or may not be able to see this outline in this diagram, just below the stomach and tucked into the duodenum is the pancreas. We've already learned about the hormonal functions of the pancreas. Now we'll learn about the digestive functions of the pancreas. So let's start with the mouth. I have a slide for you guys for each of these locations that has a summary of motility, secretions, digestion, and absorption that takes place in these areas. So I'll show you the summary and then we'll go through the details. So starting in the mouth, the major motility in the mouth is chewing. The secretions of the mouth are saliva, amylase, mucus, and lysozyme. The digestion that occurs in the mouth is a small, small bit of carbohydrate digestion. And there is no absorption of nutrients in the mouth. You can have absorption across the epithelial regions of the mouth, but that is not its function. It just happens to be that some medications and other things can be absorbed for example, by placing them under the tongue. But this is not where nutrients will be absorbed by the digestive system. So we'll start with mechanical digestion. Food enters the oral cavity, where the lips, the cheeks, which are not shown here, and the palate, the hard and soft palate, will help to guide and contain the food within the mouth. Mechanical digestion begins here, where the teeth and the tongue will mix and mechanically break down the food. So the technical term for chewing of food is mastication. And mastication is the grinding and breaking down of food that happens with the teeth. It is also important at this point to mix the food with saliva. And that is because located on the dorsal aspect of the tongue or the top of the tongue are the taste buds. And the taste buds distributed across the top of the tongue are waiting for chemical sensation that is dissolved in the saliva. And it requires the saliva to have that sensation of chemical taste. So saliva is an important secretion produced by the mouth. It is produced by the salivary glands and released into the mouth. It is mostly water but some electrolytes, some mucus, and one enzyme, salivary amylase. So salivary amylase is the enzyme for carbohydrate digestion. It is one enzyme that can break down some carbohydrate bonds. Lysozyme is another enzyme that is found in the mouth, but it's not a digestive enzyme. It's actually an antibacterial enzyme, which helps to fight and prevent bacterial infections in the mouth. Saliva also helps with motility, cleansing the mouth, and speaking. So now to the pharynx and the esophagus. So for the pharynx and esophagus, the motility is swallowing. The secretions are mucus. There is no digestion that happens in the pharynx and the esophagus, and there is no absorption that happens in the pharynx and esophagus. So here is the process of swallowing. Swallowing is a process of moving food from the pharynx through the esophagus to the stomach. So here you can see what we call a bolus 
of food. So there's that green lump of food that was just chewed up and create and and pushed into a mass by the mouth and we're now going to swallow that bolus down the throat. So I want you to notice for the oral cavity here we have the tongue and then we have the epiglottis. So the epiglottis is this cartilage structure that is going to fold over and close off the airway. So if we go forward, here we have the larynx and the trachea of the airway. The epiglottis will close that off and then the food bolus will move down the esophagus. And there are two phases of swallowing. There's the oropharyngeal phase where the bolus moves from the mouth or the oral cavity into the pharynx. This happens because the tongue propels the food into the pharynx and the bolus will then move down the pharynx. So what's important here is that the respiratory passages are closed off so that food does not enter the respiratory passages and block the respiratory passages. So the epiglottis is important for closing off the larynx and the trachea. And the uvula is here on the back of the soft palate. The uvula will close off the nasal cavity. So have you ever had this experience where you were drinking something and somebody made you laugh or, or you kind of snorted a little bit and you got some food up into your nasal cavity? It burns, right? It's not supposed to be up there. So the mucosal layer of the nasal cavity is, is not um, made for food to pass through. So it is painful actually when you get food up in the nasal cavity. So the uvula will prevent uh, food, which can be damaging. Food is sometimes hot, food is sometimes acidic, um, etc. Um, from getting up into the nasal passageways and also getting down into the, the, the respiratory passageway and that's where you have a risk of choking and closing off the airway. So that would be very dangerous. So the bolus is going to move down, it's going to be pushed by the tongue back down the back of the throat, that's the oropharyngeal phase, and then we're going to go down the pharynx towards the esophagus for the pharyngoesophageal phase. So it's going to move down the esophagus to the stomach, and it's going to use a wave of motility called peristalsis. At this point, once we get past the larynx, then the respiratory passages can reopen. So there's the bolus moving down, the oropharyngeal phase, and here you can see the epiglottis closing off the larynx and trachea. There you can see the uvula closing off the nasal passageway. And then we get down to the pharyngoesophageal phase where we have passed the open airway, excuse me, passed the closed airway and the airway can now reopen and then the bolus of food will move down the esophagus. Once we're in the esophagus, the esophagus has smooth muscle, both circular muscle and longitudinal muscle, which will have circular and longitudinal waves of contraction we call peristalsis. So that is involuntary and that will continue to move the food down into the stomach. So the esophagus is closed off at its upper and lower ends by sphincters as well. So the esophageal sphincters are these. There's the pharyngoesophageal sphincter, which is between the pharynx and the esophagus. This prevents air from entering the esophagus when food is not being swallowed. There's also the cardiac sphincter, also called the gastroesophageal sphincter, which is between the esophagus and the stomach. This controls the entry of food into the stomach and prevents stomach acid backflow. So if you've ever heard of anybody who's gotten heartburn, this region is located near the heart, right where the esophagus exits the diaphragm and then enters the stomach. So if stomach acid 
does get past the cardiac or gastroesophageal sphincter and backs up into the esophagus and you get this burning sensation that feels like it's at the base of your heart. It's actually in your esophagus. People who are um, uh, going through pregnancy with extra abdominal pressure from the baby pushing on the diaphragm, um, people who have a lot of belly fat and are carrying extra weight in their abdomen um, are more at risk for um, heart heartburn um, or um, this acid backing up into the esophagus. Okay, let's do a quick summary of the mouth and the pharynx esophagus before we move on to the stomach. Okay, so we'll start with the mouth. So the functions of the mouth are chewing. And the major enzyme found in the mouth is amylase. Now when you guys find enzymes, I want you to note what they break down. So amylase breaks down carbohydrates. And is there anything else special about the mouth? Yes, the mouth is responsible for chewing or mastication. Mechanical breakdown of the food. So functions, chewing, that is called mastication. Major enzymes, amylase. Anything else special about the mouth that we want to note? Yes. We're also going to add saliva production. And then we can move to the pharynx and esophagus. So uh, for the pharynx and esophagus, oh, that is yellow. That's not going to show up. Let's do brown. So for the pharynx and the esophagus, the major functions are motility and swallowing. Are there any enzymes in the pharynx and esophagus? No. Anything else interesting in the pharynx and esophagus? Not really. I mean, mainly we have this process of swallowing, and then we also have um, in the pharynx and esophagus, we have some sphincters. So let's list those. We have the uvula, not a sphincter, but it is closing off the nasal passageways. We have the epiglottis, which is closing off the airways. We have the cardiac sphincter. and the pharyngoesophageal sphincter. Okay. No absorption, no digestion, no really exciting secretions other than mucus in the pharynx and esophagus. So now we can move on to the stomach. So the motility in the stomach continues with peristalsis. The secretions of the stomach are actually several. So as a whole, we call them gastric juices, and these include, include hydrochloric acid, pepsin, mucus, something called intrinsic factor. And in the stomach, we have a tiny bit of digestion, a little bit of carbohydrate digestion, a little bit of protein digestion, and a little bit of absorption. Alcohol can be absorbed in the stomach, although it's not a nutrient, despite what some of you college students might think. And aspirin can be absorbed in the stomach, but no major nutrient absorption. And I want right now to make sure that we emphasize that the stomach, despite what we hear commonly out there, um, sort of just in general knowledge, the stomach is not the central organ of the digestive system. 
the major job of the stomach is to store food. So the stomach is very large and it contains many, many folds that will stretch and expand as we add more and more food to the stomach. So the esophagus will come in and meet the gastroesophageal sphincter. The food will then enter the stomach and it will stretch, stretch, stretch as the stomach fills. It will then mechanically break down the food and then send little bits through the sphincter between the stomach and the small intestine, which is the pyloric sphincter. So the primary function of the stomach is to store large contents of partially digested food. And now we don't call it a bolus anymore. Now we call it chyme. So the folds in the stomach that allow it to expand, these tiny little folds that you see throughout the stomach wall, are called rugi. Empty, the stomach is about 50 milliliters in volume, but it can fill up to a liter or a thousand milliliters before it becomes distended and uncomfortable. The pyloric sphincter closes off the end of the stomach down here between the stomach and the small intestine to hold the food and slowly release it so the small intestine can do its job. So again, the stomach is not the central organ of the digestive system. The stomach is the food storage location. The small intestine, however, is the central organ of the digestive system. The small intestine is doing all of the work. So the stomach is going to provide small bits of chyme to the small intestine and the small intestine will work on it, digest and absorb everything that it can through the length of the small intestine. So the movement of food through the stomach is also called peristalsis and this happens through just like we talked about for the esophagus, so circular muscles will squeeze longitudinal muscles will push things down, but in addition the stomach has a third layer of oblique muscles that will push in a sideways direction and break down food that way as well. So peristalsis are these waves of smooth muscle contractions and they are helpful for gastric mixing, which is this mechanical breakdown of food. They are also helpful for propelling or emptying chyme from the stomach into the small intestine. So as the food is being pushed, small bits will end up moving from the, the stomach to the small intestine and we call that gastric emptying. So whenever you see the word gastric, gastric or gastro refers to the stomach and we have both mixing and emptying of the stomach that is increased by waves of smooth muscle contractions. So there is also a time where the pyloric sphincter will be closed and the stomach will be primarily mixing. So that is the gastric mixing and there will be very little chyme actually entering the small intestine. Then as the waves increase, you will have small amounts of chyme passing through through these more longitudinal waves, pushing small amounts into the small intestine through the pyloric sphincter. So the motility of the stomach is regulated to make sure that we get enough mechanical breakdown, but not too much emptying until the small intestine is ready. So first, there is a sensation of fullness or volume in the stomach. When the stomach is more full, motility and emptying will be stimulated. There's also a sensation of fluidity in the stomach, or how solid or how fluid the chyme is within the stomach. When it is more broken down or more fluid, the chyme will be easier to move and the emptying will be stimulated. We also have sensations of molecules within the stomach high levels of fat, high levels of acid, 
or large distance distension of the small intestine next door will inhibit emptying until the small intestine can process more. We don't want a lot of acid entering the small intestine. And if you have a very high fatty meal, it takes time for the small intestine to process that. So the small intestine will tell the stomach to slow down and stop emptying until more can be processed. Stress can also affect motility and emptying of the stomach via the domination of the sympathetic nervous system over the parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system inhibits digestion because your body has more stressful and urgent things to worry about than digestion. So some of this is achieved through enterogastrones. Enterogastrones are a group of hormones released from the small intestine. So I want you guys to circle this on your slide. They're released from the small intestine. And this is the small intestine saying, hey, I've got enough to work on. Don't send me any more. Hey, professor, haven't you given us enough homework? Don't give us any more, right? We're busy. Let me finish this before you assign me something else, right? So this is the small intestine sending out signals to the stomach to inhibit motility and emptying. So they're saying, slow down. I need some time to work. And these enterogastrones are cholecystokinin, or CCK, and secretin. They will give the small intestine more time to process high fatty meals, more time to neutralize stomach acid, and more time to absorb nutrients because the stomach can store the food in the meantime. So it's telling the stomach to store the food and wait while the small intestine is doing its job. So a little bit more on the secretions of the stomach. So the stomach secretes gastric juices, about two liters of gastric juice per day. That's a lot, right? So within these, within the lining of the stomach, we have what's called gastric pits. So this is the epithelial or the lining layer of the stomach. This would be the center of the stomach where the food moves through, so the lumen. And the epithelial layer dips down and forms these pits we call gastric pits. Within the gastric pits, there are exocrine, exocrine cells that form the secretions, that make the secretions we call gastric juices. And there's three different specialized cell types. There are mucus cells that make thin watery mucus. There are chief cells that make an enzyme. This enzyme is pepsinogen. Whenever you see an ogen or a pro within an enzyme, that is a precursor enzyme that needs to be broken down and processed before it becomes active. So pepsinogen is a precursor enzyme that when activated becomes pepsin. So pepsin is an enzyme that digests proteins and breaks down peptide bonds. Then there are parietal cells and the parietal cells make stomach acid, which is HCL or hydrochloric acid. So hydrochloric acid has many functions in the stomach and here they are. First, hydrochloric acid is what is responsible for activating pepsinogen into pepsin. So it will break down the pepsinogen into its active form, pepsin. Hydrochloric acid can also break down tough fibrous foods. It will make them smaller but it is not a chemical enzymatic breakdown. It's an acid breakdown. It can denature proteins to make them easier to work on. And it will also kill bacteria and other microorganisms. So this function is also very important for um, helping the immune system. So if the food that we eat has bacteria or microorganisms in it, then the hydrochloric acid can help to um, neutralize that bacteria. So again, the hydrochloric acid is made by the parietal cells, and that activates the pepsinogen made by the chief cells. 
Finally, let's look at some of the hormones secreted. So there are other cells within the gastric pit that secrete hormones. One hormone is called gastrin. Gastrin increases all gastric juices when protein levels are high in the stomach. So this supports the stomach mucosa growth and supports the digestion of proteins. Histamine increases hydrochloric acid. You've heard of histamine in the allergic response. This is a different function for histamine. Somatostatin inhibits hydrochloric acid, gastrin, and histamine when acid is too high. So somatostatin is going to slow down these secretions if the acid levels get to be too much. So this is just a summary of the cells in the stomach, the mucus cells, the chief cells, and the parietal cells. And then here are the names of the cells that make those hormones that we just discussed, but I'm less concerned with you guys naming those cells than knowing the hormones, histamine, gastrin, and somatostatin. So histamine and gastrin will increase stomach acid. Somatostatin will decrease stomach acid. Okay, let's do a summary of the stomach before we move on. Okay, so the location is the stomach. And the function of the stomach is food storage. In addition to that, we have one enzyme produced by the stomach, pepsinogen, which gets activated to pepsin by hydrochloric acid. Pepsin breaks down proteins. The stomach also has several other secretions, mainly hydrochloric acid, mucus, and then some hormones, histamine, gastrin, and somatostatin. Other functions of the stomach include mechanical breakdown or mixing and emptying to the small intestine. Okay, the last secretion of the stomach that I want to show you is intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor facilitates the absorption of vitamin B12, and this is important particularly in um, clinical patients that have gastric bypass. So B12 is an essential vitamin that um, is needed for basic cellular function and cell division. And intrinsic factor is necessary for that absorption. So patients who have gastric bypass have to take vitamin B12 as a supplement. All right. Um, we're now going to go to the pancreas and the liver, which are accessory organs to the small intestine. So they are putting secretions into the small intestine to help the small intestine do its job. So the pancreas has many secretions, which are enzymes, trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase, amylase, lipase, and then one major secretion that is not an enzyme, sodium bicarbonate. The liver does many things, but for digestion, it secretes bile, which will be stored in the gallbladder. So the pancreas and liver are both accessory organs to the digestive system. They are not part of the hollow organ system that is continuous from mouth to anus they are secreting into the small intestine and helping the small intestine do its job. So they both have ducts 
that enter the upper portion of the small intestine, the duodenum. So the bile ducts and the pancreatic ducts enter together into the duodenum and they will put their digestive secretions into the duodenum to help it digest. So they are not part of the digestive tract and they have other non-digestive functions, which is why we call them accessory organs to the digestive system. So first, the pancreas. The pancreas has a group of digestive cells we call acinar cells. They secrete the pancreatic juice into the duodenum. Pancreatic juices include enzymes for carbohydrate and lipid digestion. There's pancreatic amylase and pancreatic lipase. Both of those are secreted in their active form. And then there are also protein digesting enzymes. They are not secreted in their active form. They are secreted as ogen and pro, so these are precursors, trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, and procarboxypeptidase. They will then be activated once they reach the small intestine. So trypsinogen will be activated into trypsin, chymotrypsinogen will be activated into chymotrypsin, and procarboxypeptidase will be activated into carboxypeptidase. So think about why you wouldn't want protein digesting enzymes to be active in the pancreas. Did you figure it out? It would digest itself. You might not have thought of that before, but if these enzymes were allowed to stay in the pancreas in active form, they could damage the pancreas. So they cannot be secreted in active form, and they must be activated then only once they reach the small intestine, which is protected from these enzymes. Also, we have alkaline fluid or sodium bicarbonate rich fluid secreted from the pancreas into the duodenum, and that is to neutralize the acid coming in from the stomach. So remember that the stomach was secreting hydrochloric acid and it has very, very low pH. So all of that chyme that is being mixed and churned and combined with hydrochloric acid is going to enter the duodenum and it could damage the duodenal lining. So for that reason, the pancreas is going to release sodium bicarbonate to neutralize the stomach acid. So here's a better picture. Um, close-up of the stomach to the duodenum or the upper portion of the small intestine and then the bile ducts coming down from the liver and the pancreatic duct so here is the pancreas sitting below the stomach and tucked into the corner of the duodenum there where we will have these acinar cells secreting their contents into the pancreatic ducts and then into the duodenum. So these are regulated as well, and they can, the cells of the pancreas um, and the cells of the small intestine can talk to each other. So if there is a lot of acid in the duodenum, it will increase a hormone called secretin. That will talk to the pancreas and tell the pancreas through the bloodstream to increase sodium bicarbonate solution. So acid will trigger secretin. Secretin will travel through the blood to increase a neutralizing solution to protect the duodenum. Fat and protein high in the duodenum will increase cholecystokinin, which will be um, carried also by the blood, so it is another hormone to activate the pancreas and increase secretion of enzymes into the duodenum. So this is the duodenum talking to the pancreas and saying, one, if it's too acidic, I need some neutralization, and two, if I have a lot of fat and protein, I need more enzymes to take care of that. The liver also performs many functions. Um, separate from digestion, but it contributes to digestion by secreting bile. 
So bile contains bile salts, which have a role in fat digestion. It also contains some breakdown products, red blood cell breakdown, bilirubin, cholesterol, lecithin, and alkaline fluid. When bile is not actively being secreted from the liver to the duodenum, it will back up the bile ducts and go into the gallbladder where the gallbladder will store it. So here's what the bile salts do for fat digestion. I want you guys to get out some notes. We will draw this when I'm done describing it, but I want you to know this process very well. So bile salts are a component of bile that is necessary for fat digestion, but they are not an enzyme. What they're going to do is a process called emulsification. So you have this huge droplet of fat, you take this big blob of fat from whatever fatty meal you just ate, and the bile salts are gonna come in and separate the large fat globules into smaller fat droplets. These are gonna to help to suspend the fat droplets into the aqueous solution and also increase surface area so that the lipases or the fat digesting enzymes can do their job. So whenever you see A's, you wanna think A's means breakdown, that's going to be an enzyme. And then you look for the root word that comes before it. This is breakdown of lip or lipids. So lipases break down lipids and they're gonna chemically be breaking down the fats after emulsification occurs. Once they do that, then something called micelles will be formed. Micelles are water-soluble transport vesicles that are also formed by bile salts and this other product, lecithin. They're going to surround the lipid-soluble substances after they're broken down to help them stay in solution and get absorbed. So this is after the lipases do their job. So for example, triglycerides, fatty acids, fat-soluble vitamins, and cholesterol will be surrounded by these vesicles called micelles. From there, the micelles will enter into the small intestine walls and form something called chylomicrons. These are larger particles of fat-soluble substances made from the contents of micelles, and those will then move from the small intestine into the lymphatics. So let's draw this out quickly because this is an important concept for the digestive system. Okay, so the liver is going to make bile. The bile will enter the bile ducts and go into the small intestine. The upper portion of the small intestine is the duodenum. So it's going to enter duodenum. And now let's blow up the duodenum and look inside. So here's the duodenum, where you just had this huge meal, and you've got some big droplets of fat, big blobs of fat within the lumen of the small intestine. So what's going to happen is those bile salts are going to come in and they're going to surround and emulsify the fat droplets into smaller droplets. And they will surround those droplets so that then lipase can come in. So we first require the bile salts to emulsify the fat. And then we can do the enzyme breakdown. With the lipase. 
the enzymes are going to break down the lipids into fatty acids and triglycerides. These are the breakdown products of lipids. And from there, those fatty acids and triglycerides that have been broken down by the lipase are going to get repackaged into my cells. So the third step is to package into my cells. Now the my cells are able to enter the epithelial cells which line the lumen of the small intestine. So here's some epithelial cells. The my cells can fuse with the membrane of the epithelial cells and enter and release their products, the fatty acids, triglycerides, etc. And then they will get repackaged into these larger structures, chylomicrons. The chylomicrons then are going to exit with vitamins, triglycerides, fatty acids, cholesterol, and they're going to enter into the lymph. Can't even read that. Let me write that again. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Into the lymph. So, large globules of fat, mechanically, mechanically broken down or emulsified by the bile salts. Then lipase comes in and chemically breaks them down. They're repackaged into my cells so they can exit the lumen and go through the epithelial cells. Once they get into the epithelial cells, they'll be repackaged as chylomicrons, where they can then enter into the body through the lymphatics. So all of that is happening in the small intestine with the help of the bile. The small intestine will also be aided by the secretions of the pancreas. So we should add those guys to our list as well, but let's add them after we do the small intestine because it'll make more sense. So for motility of the small intestine, we have a new form of motility called segmentation. We have some secretions of the small intestine, mucus and salt. So notice there are no enzymes secreted by the small intestine. There are some enzymes made by the small intestine. They're called brush border enzymes, but they're not technically secreted. They're stuck to the wall of the small intestine. And I'm not going to list them here because I want to emphasize the pancreatic enzymes that are used by the small intestine as the primary source of digestive enzymes. So the pancreas is going to put the digestive enzymes into the small intestine where the majority of digestion in the digestive system is going to happen. So the digestion of carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids will be primarily done in the small intestine and it will be completed in the small intestine. From there, those breakdown products will be absorbed. So all nutrients, electrolytes, and some electrolytes and some water will be absorbed by the small intestine. So let me emphasize this again. The small intestine is the central organ of the digestive system. Nearly all chemical digestion and absorption in the digestive tract takes place in the small intestine. The three regions are the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. The main motility which helps this digestion take place is segmentation. Segmentation is different from peristalsis because it's more circular muscles going back and forth. So it's a series of ring-like contractions that mixes and propels the chyme in the small intestine 
and it travels at about travels it it's paced at about 9 to 12 cycles per minute so it'll take about 3 to 5 hours to move food completely through the small intestine and i like this image because it just shows you know two different chunks of food and how they would be slowly and progressively mixed by the circular motions of segmentation. It's also very important to note and to remember from anatomy that small intestine has a high surface area. It has folds upon folds upon folds to increase surface area for absorption. The largest folds, which you can see with the naked eye, are called the plaque. Plaque circularis, these are the circular folds. If you pull out a plaque and you look within that, you'll see that there are villi, or folds along the plaque. And if you pull out a single villus, you will see that each individual cell also has microvilli, or this tiny little brush appearance. Because the microvilli look like a brush, they're also called the brush border. Here's another zoom in of the plaque that you can see. These are the circular folds within the small intestine. Then there's a zoom in of the villus. Individual villi along the plaque. And a zoom in of a single villus where now you can see the individual epithelial cells with those microvilli on top. So the microvilli are tiny little projections on individual epithelial cells. So even at the most microscopic level, the small intestine has as much surface area as possible for absorption. So there are some secretions from the small intestine, but not the major digestive enzymes. Again, the major digestive enzymes for the small intestine come from the pancreas. The small intestine does secrete some aqueous salt solution and some mucus, but the majority of the aqueous solution will also come from the pancreas. There are, however, exceptions. So there are tiny enzymes located on the microvilli, which are sort of the last stop. So after the pancreatic enzymes do their job within the small intestine, there are occasionally, for example, disaccharides that need to be broken down into monosaccharides. There's one last step that might need to happen for the final digestion and absorption to take place. So here are the brush border enzymes. There's one called um, there's, there's a group called disaccharidases, which is what I just told you. It breaks down double sugar rings into single sugar rings. There are aminopeptidases, which will take peptides and break them down into their final amino acids. And there's also something called enterokinase, which activates the trypsin enzyme that comes from the pancreas. There are also hormones secreted by the small intestine. I showed you these when we talked about the stomach, but let's look at them again because they actually come from the small intestine. So when we do our drawing, we're going to put them under the small intestine list. So these are called enterogastrones, and they're released from the small intestine based on what needs to happen in the stomach. So the small intestine will tell the stomach to inhibit or stop if there's too much acid or too much protein and fat being sensed in the duodenum. So it will give the small intestine more time to process high fatty meals, to neutralize stomach acid and absorb nutrients. How does absorption happen? Absorption occurs through the epithelial cells of the small intestine. This generally happens through secondary active transport using sodium and hydrogen ion gradients to transport small molecules across the epithelium into the epithelial cells. So this will include electrolytes, water, monosaccharides, simple sugars, and amino acids. But we only, can, we only need to do passive diffusion for lipids. 
So fatty acids and triglycerides, after the micelles have delivered them, can diffuse across. And vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins, can diffuse across. So let's take a moment before we get into the details of digestion, let's take a moment to summarize the small intestine. And for that, I want to actually go back to, sorry if I'm making you guys dizzy, go back to the pancreas and the liver. Okay, so we are in now the small intestine. And the small intestine is going to be the primary digestion and absorption organ. The enzymes that are from the pancreas are listed here. We have amylase. for carbohydrates, we have lipase for lipids, and then we have the protein digesting enzymes. I'm going to write them as their active form, but please remember that they have to be activated before they can do their job in the small intestine. Trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. These are all doing protein digestion. In addition to these from the pancreas, we also have the brush borders. That are on the microvilli. What other things of note do we have in the small intestine? First, we have from the liver, we have bile. And this is for bile salts to aid in emulsification of fat. In addition, some other specialties in the small intestine, we have the cholecystokinin and secretin, which will regulate the stomach. And we also have alkaline fluid from the pancreas. I'll put it over here. in addition to the enzymes. So then from the small intestine, we also have increased surface area specializations to help with absorption. And we also have one last bit. Where'd that go? There it is, segmentation. So we do have motility in the small intestine, but it's slower to give the small intestine time to do its work. Okay, let's move on then. I'm sorry if I'm making you guys dizzy. Let's move on then to the process of digestion of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. I do want you guys to take notes on these. I can draw them out for you, but I think the book diagram does a better job. But I do want you guys to take your own notes. So get out a separate sheet of paper and draw this out too. So we have carbohydrates from the diet. For example, starch and glycogen will be broken down by the amylase enzymes. We have amylase in the saliva, 
Then we have pancreatic amylase that is delivered from the pancreas into the small intestine. That will break down starch and glycogen into maltose, which is a disaccharide. From there, the brush border enzyme, maltase, will break it down into individual glucose sugar rings. The similar process for sucrose and lactose break down where we'll use the brush border enzymes to break them down into the final monosaccharides, galactose or glucose. Those then will be the absorbable units that will enter the epithelial cells of the small intestine. Then they need to be absorbed. So we will have the glucose or the fructose or the galactose, these absorbable units that can enter through channels. So these channels can be co-transporters using sodium gradients. Here's an example of a sodium glucose transporter, SGLT, which is moving sodium in at the same time, using that energy from the sodium gradient to move glucose into the cells. The glucose then will get transported using another channel on the back side of the epithelial cell called a GLUT2 channel to then cross into the blood. Do I care about the names of these channels? No, but I want you guys to know that sodium co-transport brings the glucose in and there is a channel then that will bring the glucose to the blood. Protein digestion starts with large proteins, which will then get broken down by pepsin, or pepsin in the stomach, or the proteolytic or the protein breakdown enzymes from the pancreas. So those are trypsin, chymotrypsin, and pro, um, carboxypeptidase. And they will break down the proteins either into small peptides or individual amino acids. If they're small peptides, they need to then be further broken down by the brush border enzymes into the smallest amino acids. And from amino acids then, we can absorb. So similar to what you just saw for glucose and monosaccharide and um, smaller sugars, amino acids will use co-transporters, bringing sodium in and using the energy from that sodium gradient to bring amino acids into the cell. They will then be transported on the other end by other channels, which will allow the amino acids to leave the cells and get into the blood. If they are small peptides and not individual amino acids, then they can be broken down by peptidases within the cell and then transported as amino acids back into the blood. Both the sodium co-transport of amino acids and the sodium co-transport of carbohydrates requires a sodium gradient to be established in the fluid outside of the cells. So for that, we need to pump the sodium out of the inner compartment of the cells with the sodium potassium ATPase. This is the same sodium potassium pump you guys heard about in the nervous system, but here it's removing the sodium from the inside of the epithelial cells so that the sodium gradient is maintained and sodium will continue to want to enter the cell because it will stay low inside. Now the last bit, we've already drawn out most of it, but let's complete it. The last is lipid digestion. So dietary fat or large droplets of fat will be broken down mechanically, I think about this as mechanically because it's not enzymes, by bile salts. And bile salts will separate the big fat droplets into smaller fat droplets. And then the pancreatic lipase can break it down into glycerides and fatty acids. From there, the bile salts will be used again to surround the the lipid building blocks and form micelles. The micelles will then help to bring the fats to the epithelial cells where they will enter the epithelial cells. From there they'll get repackaged into chylomicrons and those chylomicrons are what will actually enter into the lacteals. 
So fats do not enter directly into the bloodstream. Fats go into the lacteals where they will be processed by the lymphatic system before entering the blood. From the small intestine, the last region of the small intestine is the ileum. By the time you reach the ileum, the majority of nutrients should be broken down and absorbed. And we then have a sphincter, the ileocecal valve, which is going to push the partially, the, the undigested food into the large intestine. And this region of the large intestine is called the cecum. So now let's move on to large intestine and we're almost done because we're getting down to the bottom. So the large intestine is important for motility and it has two types of movements, one called mass movement, another called haustral contractions. The main secretion of the large intestine is mucus and that's because at this point the digestion and absorption should be complete. So the mucus is just going to help to lubricate whatever is left over and move that through the remaining digestive tract so that it can be eliminated. There is no digestion that takes place in the large intestine. There is, however, a little bit of absorption of water and salt. So the digestion and absorption processes are mostly complete by the time the chyme reaches the large intestine. Another word for large intestine you will hear is colon. So what's left is undigested waste, unabsorbed bile, and excess fluid. The colon will absorb water and salt to help to compact the waste and also retain water and salt back into the body. It will then propel the waste forward up through the ascending colon, across the transverse colon, down the descending colon, to the sigmoid colon for removal out of the rectum and anus. There are two types of motility in the large intestine. The haustra are these little pouches you see in the large intestines. So haustral contractions are these ring-like contractions surrounding the haustra. These are very slow. There's one about every 30 minutes. Mass movements then are even slower, and these are contractions of full segments of the colon. So large segments of the colon driving undigested waste forward, and this drives the defecation or waste removal reflex. About three to four mass movements per day. These are triggered by a reflex called the gastrocolic reflex that I'll tell you about in a minute. So defecation is the removal of undigested waste out of the rectum. So the rectum wall, the rectum is the last portion after the food leaves, excuse me, after the chyme, or at this point it's really feces. So after the feces leaves the sigmoid colon, it enters the rectum. And the rectum wall becomes distended and stretched. And that signals to the body that there is waste there that needs to be eliminated. At this point, signals will be sent from the, um, from the nervous system to the internal anal sphincter which is a smooth muscle. This is an involuntary smooth muscle that will open up and tell us that it's time to eliminate the waste. This is parasympathetic driven. And then the external anal sphincter is voluntary or skeletal muscle, and it is a circular muscle that can be closed in case the timing of elimination is not the right time. So you can hold off, by squeezing on the external anal sphincter and that is voluntary to prevent defecation. But when it's time you'll release that control and open up the sphincters and allow the defecation to occur. So in addition to the defecation reflex and the tiny a bit 
bit of water and salt that can be absorbed in the large intestine. There is also um, a lot of information, and you probably hear a lot about this recently when we talk about probiotics and things like that. So a lot of information on good bacteria in the large intestine. So bacteria will accumulate in the large intestine because the motility is slow enough to allow that to happen. And there's an estimated 500 to 1,000 species of bacteria in the colon. These are beneficial bacteria that can prevent pathogenic bacteria from growing. They can also help to break down diet, dietary fibers. So fibers are notoriously difficult to break down, and the bacteria help us do that. Unfortunately, the byproduct of bacteria breaking down dietary fibers is gas. So if you eat a high fiber meal, you will see that your body will produce more gas. Gas helps to promote, promote motility, and the bacteria can also help to maintain mucosa. There are also certain populations of bacteria that synthesize vitamin K, which is an important vitamin for blood clotting. So here's an overview of the structures of the large intestine. And now let's put that into our chart and we'll finish up with control of digestion. Okay, so here's our functions of the stomach. Here's our functions of the small intestine. We're starting to run out of room, but it's okay because the large intestine doesn't do much. So I'm gonna put large intestine down here. And our functions of the large intestine are really primarily motility. As part of that defecation. And the specific types of motility are haustral, contractions, and mass movement. There are no enzymes in the large intestine, and there is really no absorption or no other major functions of the large intestine, but we can put you know, this good bacteria portion of the large intestine. Let's also over here under functions, we can also put vitamin K and water salt absorption. But that's really it for the large intestine. Not super exciting. Okay, three more slides. I know this lecture is getting long, so thank you for your patience. Three more slides and then we will finish up. So there are three phases of digestive control, which we I want to review to put all of this together. So there's a cephalic phase, a gastric phase, and an intestinal phase to regulation of the digestive system. So first, the cephalic phase refers to the time when you are expecting to eat. So this is thinking about seeing, smelling, tasting, chewing, swallowing food. This is when everything is in your head. You're imagining food. The signals through the parasympathetic nervous system, through the vagus nerve, when you are thinking about or your, your body sees that food is going to be there soon, it's going to prepare. It's going to increase stomach acid. It will increase pepsinogen production, and thus pepsin in the stomach. It will increase gastrin to increase the stomach. It will increase pancreatic juices into the small intestine, and it will increase liver secretion of bile into the small intestine. So this is all preparing, adding secretions throughout the stomach and small intestine to help to prepare for food that's going to enter. Then the gastric phase. The gastric phase refers to when food enters the stomach. The stomach wall will be stretched, and often it will contain a high level of protein. This will stimulate the gastric pits to produce more gastric juices in the stomach. It will stimulate the gastric pits to release more gastrin and increase the motility of the stomach. It will stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system to increase secretions generally in the digestive system. 
and it will also contribute to this defecation, uh, excuse me, to mass movements which increase defecation in the large intestine. In addition, it will open the ileocecal valve to help to move undigested waste from the small intestine to the large intestine. So when food enters the stomach, we have what's called the gastrocolic reflex, where you put food into the stomach and you need to then eliminate what is in the large intestine to make room down the line. The last phase is the intestinal phase, when food starts to enter or the chyme starts to enter the small intestine. At this point, we're moving further down the line. The stomach has begun to empty. The stimulus for the gastric juices then will be decreased. The pH will also be very acidic or low because there will be less food present in the stomach. The enterogastrones will be released from the small intestine, that's the secretin and the cholecystokinin, to slow down the stomach so that the small intestine has time to work. That will in inhibit the gastric juices, inhibit gastric emptying, but they will also increase the pancreatic and liver secretions. So these are all about supporting the small intestine. We'll increase alkaline fluid from the pancreas to the small intestine. We'll increase the enzymes, protein, carbohydrate, and lipid digesting enzymes from the pancreas. And we'll increase the bile from the liver to the small intestine. Finally, somatostatin will be released to inhibit further stomach secretions, slowing down the stomach, and increasing activity of the small intestine. Okay, we did it. Thank you guys for your patience. Please let me know if you have any questions moving forward.